Hello, this is Pam. I am really excited to spend this time with you because I've got some huge insights to really help you to understand that if you're dealing with multiple sclerosis, why you have such horrible symptoms. This can be a very big part of the reason. So this is the topic today is how parasites cause poor circulation or they reduce circulation in MS patients. So in this video, I'm going to share with you how these parasites that infect the blood vessels in our body, how they cause inflammation and they cause a narrowing of the veins and they cause poor circulation, which can lead to all kinds of symptoms. Like we may have, I'll talk about all the symptoms, but a lot of them will be like swelling and edema and pain and stiffness, sometimes tingling and numbness. There's so many symptoms of poor circulation. So this is something that I think that a lot of people don't think about. We think about parasites in our in our intestines, in our digestive tract. We think about parasites sometimes in our organs, but we don't really realize that they could be infecting the lining of our blood vessels. And so this is what the research is showing. And so this, and then I'm not just going to talk about the, how these parasites are infecting the blood vessels and all the symptoms we're getting, but really what kind of strategies can we use to treat these infections that are lining our blood vessels and causing the narrowing of the veins, the poor circulation, and all the horrible symptoms that come with that. So if we haven't met, my name is Pam Bartha, and I'm the author of Become a Wellness Champion and the founder of Live Disease Free. And I love talking about these topics. I believe it's by the grace of God that we're doing this work. And I am so grateful because I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis over 30 years ago, uh, 34 years ago by now. And if I hadn't have known the information about these infections, and of course I didn't know what we know today, but just even the little that I knew, knew back then, 34 years ago, that helped me to deal with these infections well enough so I've been able to live MS-free for 34 years now, or I'd say 33 years because the first year was kind of rough. And so we've ded I've dedicated my life to helping others recover from chronic disease because it's one of the most rewarding things you can do is when you get your life back, when you get that second chance to help others do the same. So we've served over a thousand students in over 15 countries. And what works in India, works in Canada, works in the United States, it doesn't matter. Those of us that are dealing with chronic diseases, other ones, but also multiple sclerosis, it is caused by a parasitic infestation. And so many of you may have heard years ago how CCSVI became really popular and it was quite a costly procedure where this one doctor, Dr. Zamboni, he believed that people that had MS, that were diagnosed with MS, they had narrowed veins and he called it chronic cerebral spinal venous insufficiency or CCSVI. And really he believed that the veins in the neck and the back, the head and the neck, they became blocked or narrowed and that was a symptom of MS. And there were some studies that confirmed this. There were other studies that didn't confirm it. But basically, he came up with this um, procedure that, and it's not just MS, but through working with other doctors, we've heard that people that have autism can often have the narrowing of the veins. And we can have decreased circulation in other like in arteries too, but the veins seem to be a special place for the parasites to go because they, the, the blood flow is less and so it's just a nicer environment for them. So with Dr. Zamboni, he, he did come up with this um, term where he felt that people with MS had blocked veins and he called the treatment CCSVI. Actually, the condition is CCSVI. And then he would do the ballooning of the veins so they're uh, was a procedure. It wasn't that common in Canada, but people would travel all over to have this procedure done. And I believe it was about $15,000, 10 to $15,000 years and years ago. And now it's probably about four to $5,000. But I have honestly interviewed hundreds and hundreds of people that were diagnosed with MS. And a few of them had CCSVI done this opening up of the veins. They balloon the veins. Sometimes they'll put a stint in the vein. And some of these people had 
maybe short-term benefits, but I have yet to speak to one person that has long-term benefits from opening up the vein. So although we do have lots of symptoms of circulation problems, especially as the MS progresses, that procedure I don't believe is the best safest thing that we can do to improve our circulation. So we'll talk about that. But he called it the liberation therapy. Oh, libation. Yeah, liberation therapy. And that involved opening up the blocked, narrowed veins by inflating a small balloon in inserting or inserting a stint into that area, which would allow the blood to flow through the vein and not to kind of go back into the central nervous system. And so he felt, and other doctors felt that because the, the circulation was decreased, the blood that was supposed to travel out of the central nervous system through the veins was kind of getting backlogged. That would be a, would result in a buildup of infections and toxins and metals and cause neuron injury. So, so there is research that shows that there are microbes in chronic infections that love to settle in the lining of our blood vessels, especially in the lining of our veins, and they hide behind fibrin. We'll talk more about what fibrin is. So what I believe with this, really the big picture of multiple sclerosis, like for myself, years and years ago, before the age of, well, before the age of 20, but even before the age of 10, lots of antibiotics for, and for things like strep throat, we weren't cultured, so we just got a lot of antibiotics. And then I was on tetracycline for acne as a teenager. So all of those antibiotics really devastated my microbiome. And then I lived on a farm. You don't have to live on a farm to pick up parasites, but I did. We had all kinds of animals. And I would help my dad out in the pig barn. I loved to be with the animals. And so, and in the dirt, right? We were in uh, six kids in a little house in the prairie, and we were just in the dirt, and there's parasites in the dirt, and there's parasites they're just part of life. So because, and I, in the, out of the six children, I was on tetracycline for months for acne and none of the other kids were. And I really believe that that, and plus the other antibiotics really made me more vulnerable to the parasites in my environment. So then for years after that, I was very slim and I had stomach aches if I ate the wrong food. Like if our family got Chinese food and that was not very often, but or a hamburger, I would always be laying on the floor with a stomach ache and I had chronic constipation. So I had dysbiosis early on. I had parasites early on. And then as we, in this, maybe you can relate to some of the things. And then as we get older, we might not have the best lifestyle choices with, you know, teenage and young adult and working lots and eating the poor foods and not getting enough sleep and having too much fun partying and things like that. All of these things. And then having children. So the changes in hormones will really impact the parasites, really allow them to to grow more quickly. They thrive on the changes in the hormones. So what I believe is that this narrowing of the vein, so like, so we can have these chronic parasite infections, but we don't have MS, but there comes this tipping point where maybe the burden, even of the larger parasites are too big combined with the fungal, fungal overgrowth combined with the smaller parasites, the protus is becoming too out of balance. And then our immune system is not dealing with things as well. And then I believe that's when we end up with these smaller parasites that are going to be invading the lines, the, the blood vessel lining, especially the veins. And with that, when the infections do line the, the blood vessel or the vein, the, it's called the endothelial, the lining, when they do line that, then that causes a lot of immune reactions in that area because our immune system would be trying to deal with it. And of course, we know that inflammation is the immune system's response to infection. So we have the immune system fighting the infections located in our veins. And then we have inflammation, which is like the war going on. And we can have scarring and we can have some veins that become more narrowed. And we do get a buildup of this fibrin, which is a protein. So fibrinogen is converted to fibrin. And it's really important in the healing process, in, in regulating our immune system. Like our immune system is amazing. And I really 
take offense when we're told that our immune system is just randomly attacking itself. I don't believe that's the case. I believe that our immune system is attacking an infection, that that's what its job is. And sure, there might be some damage to tissue from the infection, from the war where our immune system is fighting the infection, but really that is the case. So when you have the inflammation, remember that swelling and, and, and you have deposits of fibrin, this is where we get the reduced blood flow and swelling. And that can not just occur in the blood vessels throughout our body, but it can also occur in the blood vessels in our central nervous system. So, and then we can end up with more damage to our nerves. So as MS progresses, people have more, and people that have MS, they have a growing number of symptoms of poor circulation. Maybe you can relate to some of these things. So symptoms of poor circulation can include tingling or pins and needles, sensation in the skin, throbbing or stinging pain in your limbs, muscle cramps, and also muscles that hurt or they feel weak when you walk. So if we have less oxygen, less nutrients to our muscles, we can feel weak also. Pale or blue skin color. So very often where the blood is restricted, you might have kind of like a blue color to the skin. Cold fingers and toes, numbness, chest pain and swelling and stiffness. So those are just a few symptoms of poor circulation. And there can be many more. I'm just giving you just a kind of an overview here. Um, and I think I said muscle spasms too, muscle cramps. Yes. So our body produces this fibrin. It's like a network uh, of protein that it really helps the healing process. So when our tissues are damaged and so the fibrin, it's a clotting protein and it plays a really important role in infection, inflammation, immunology, and wound healing. And it's found in the infected blood veins in the body, but also in the blood veins in the central nervous system. And if you look at it, you can just do a Google search and you can look up pictures of fibrin and it really just looks like this mesh. And that's what the science has been finding that these infections will hide behind the fibrin. So they're embedded in the lining of the blood vessels and then there's this fibrin on top. So what's interesting is that I've shared this in previous live events that I've done is that with multiple sclerosis and I'm sure many other neurological disorders, there is a disruption in the blood brain barrier. So that's one of the earliest signs of multiple sclerosis. So I've, show, I've shown some research, for, and I think it's out of the University of Calgary, but where they found that certain bacteria in your intestines, it could be other parasites too, but they identified certain bacteria that produce such strong neurotoxins that they, once they cross into the, they a lot of them will cause leaky gut too. So they'll go into the blood, they'll move, and they'll cause leaky blood brain barrier. So we don't just have a leaky intestine intestinal lining, but we also have a leaky blood brain barrier. And there's lots of research showing this. So sometimes it's the poisons produced by these infections themselves. And that's one of the earliest signs of the disease process of multiple sclerosis. So blood brain barrier disturbances is linked to, with the inflammation and white matter injury that defines MS. So this is known in science. And fibrin deposits are found in early multiple sclerosis lesions and areas of demyelination close to inflammation and damaged axons. So it makes sense that if we have, and I've shared pictures that I believe it's Dr. Alan McDonald, I showed actual images of a cross section of an axon. So that's a nerve fiber. It's kind of like if your nerve fiber is long like this and there's myelin sheath around the nerve fiber. Well, if you just take a cut like that and then you do a front section of it looking straight at it and you can see the center of the axon and you can see the myelin sheath around it and you can see little brillia bacteria infecting the myelin, right? So we know that that our immune system, our T and our B cells are not attacking, intentionally attacking our, our nerves, that they are dealing with infection close to or within the nerve fiber itself that is infecting the nerve fiber. And so 
fibrin is when there is damage to nerves, when there's damage to vessels, the fibrin is going to be present. It's part of the, you know, the, the, the whole incredibly complex immune system that we have. We have these cytokines and chemokines, these different molecules, and we have all these different cells, and we have all these different interleukin that upregulate and downregulate, and we have this fibrin that produces this network of for healing to like a clot formation. So it's this amazing, amazing immune system, and we have to appreciate it, and we have to support it. We have to really honor it and help take some of the stress away from it and not think that it is out to get us and it is out to it. And it breaks my heart when I hear people think, you know, my immune system is just killing me, right? That's not the truth. That is something that we have been told is convenient so that we will never treat the parasite, so that we will continue to suppress our immune system. And when we do that with these immunosuppressive drugs, these disease modifying drugs, it's brutal. It is a life of misery. So in Alzheimer's disease, fibrin deposits, they build up in the central nervous system, blood vessels also. So this has been shown. Um, and we know, again, that this is involved in infection. That's what the job is like. Duh. It's like such common sense. Our immune system is there to defend us from enemies, right? And this is all part of the immune response for clearing the infections, for wound healing, etc. So in multiple sclerosis, the presence of fibrin and, and other things can lead to the recruitment of T cells, which we need. And we don't want to block our T cells and our B cells out of our immune system. We need them because our, we know that the central nervous system is not a sterile environment. So we don't want to block our T and B cells from the central nervous system because we need to protect our central nervous system from infections. So you may have come across this. There's a ton of ads on YouTube, et cetera, where they're like, you know, like this one protein can be causing all your stiffness and your pain and we've got a remedy for you. And then you listen to their talk and it's about taking these proteolytic enzymes, these enzymes that help to break down fibrin, right? And fibrin is present because of the chronic infection. So it's fine to help you know, if that helps relieve some pain, but your body's going to keep making fibrin if you don't deal with the infection. So, so we could use things like serapeptase or uh, natokinase. Those are two enzymes that you can get in health food stores and, and they help with pe people that have these inflammatory autoimmune diseases. So we've noticed that, that, and they can also help to break up the biofilms too of these infections. And we've talked about biofilms, how the parasites like to hide behind the biofilms. I was going to say, Go ahead and type your questions in the question box. I'll take a few minutes when I'm done to share, to answer some of your questions. So it's one thing to help to manage symptoms of maybe possibly taking some of these enzymes that will help to break down the protein. But again, let's treat the cause. Let's treat the infections that are causing the fibrin buildup, the inflammation, the immune responses that are in our blood veins. And this can be another reason why when we take certain herbs, we might feel really awful because maybe we're taking too much herb and, and it's really causing like the, we call it an angry parasite syndrome, where it's kind of a reaction. The parasites are reacting and they can produce more poisons. They're kind of being confronted. Maybe it's not effective enough. And so that's why you need a plan to treat. That's why you need to understand, okay, so I, I may have a lot of these infections, not just in my intestines, not just in my central nervous system, like in the lesions, but also in my blood veins and possibly arteries too, but more so in the blood veins. So what kind of things can we use? So number one with our students is they follow the live disease free plan. And I'll tell you about that in a minute. But when you're treating, you really want to target the, the different parasites that you're dealing with, and we're not all dealing with exactly the same parasites. It would be easy if it would be an easy fix. But oxidative therapies can be helpful here. So you might know about ozone, and I did an actual talk last week about oxygen therapies in treating parasites. And if you didn't listen to that, I would really encourage you to go back and listen. So that would have been just last week. And I did not post it on Facebook or YouTube because it's too sensitive for them. Like there's, 
it's just not a good place to post it there. So I posted it on our live disease free channel on Rumble. So that if there's really important information that I want to share with you that is too sensitive for Facebook and YouTube, then I will share it on Rumble and I will probably share, I'm going to be uploading more of my videos there. So that's a safe place to find because they allow this information to come out. That's what's really important. So I shared last week, we talked about hydrogen peroxide therapy, we talked about hyperbaric chambers, we talked about ozone, and we talked about this other cost effective that I can't even mention the name of it here, but it's very cost effective, it's very effective, it's way cheaper than ozone because you can do this at home it's a very, very like $50 will last you for a couple of months. You can actually bring oxygen into your body every hour. You can, but you don't start with it right away. But it's so incredibly helpful for all chronic diseases. It's just delivering oxygen into your blood. And oxygen is like a little bomb that will kill these different parasites. Like we mentioned Babesia and or I think I mentioned them all. So these are just a few that they have found, but there's many, many more. But things like Babesia, let's see here, I just, a few that they have found, uh, let's see. There is Rickettsia, Babesia, Borrelia, viruses, and many other small parasites can be infecting the lining of our blood vessels for sure. And again, causing the narrowing, causing the buildup of fibrin, the inflammation, like the war and decreased circulation and all of these horrible symptoms. So a lot of us are not thinking about that. Again, we're thinking about treating the gut, we're thinking about treating you know, systemically, but we're not realizing that how valuable it is to add in that oxygen therapy. So yes, we can use herbs, and we have found that the parasite drugs are actually even more helpful, but we use a combination of the parasite drugs, the herbs, but also the oxygen therapies. And we used to really love ozone. It's still great, but it's just a bigger investment for people to get into. And honestly, this other oxidizing agent, you can actually treat yourself more throughout the day. You can actually have, and it's so incredibly helpful. So I'm not going to talk any more about it because I just want to go. So you can watch it again, how oxygen therapies are used to treat parasites. Go to Live Disease Free Rumble, R-U-M-B-L-E, and you'll find that video there from last week. And I'm just like starting to upload videos there because I I want to share more truth with you. So what we can do again, and I'll just make sure I finish everything here. So again, fibrin is a clotting protein. It really helps in the wound and healing of tissue. It plays a very important role in infection, inflammation, and in immunology and wound healing. I'll just see if there's anything thus that I wanted to share. No, I think that, oh, I did want to talk about cholesterol levels too. So this is another thing that we notice is that when our students are following a high fat diet, the live disease free diet, their cholesterol normalizes. And how is that possible? Because like from many, many years, the experts have been telling us like, oh, you cannot eat a high fat diet or you're going to have really bad cholesterol. LDL will be really significantly elevated. Well, there are many really wonderful doctors like Dr. Perlmutter and others that are setting the record straight. And it is what the truth is, is that our body produces cholesterol in response to inflammation. So we have these infections that line our blood vessels and our veins. And so then we can end up with our body producing, that's another response of our body trying to protect itself, producing the cholesterol. And so when you decrease, and carbohydrates are the favorite food for these parasites. So when you decrease the carbs, then the infections are not going to flourish like they did when you give them lots of food. And when they're not happy and flourishing, you notice decreased inflammation. So that is really important. And with the decreased inflammation, then we are on our way to recovery. So what we notice with our students is when they're following the live disease free diet, their cholesterol normalizes, it becomes healthy, they're able to come off their cholesterol medications while working with their doctor, their blood pressure 
normalizes. There are so many so many medications that come off. There are bladder issues normalized. So we're just talking about one little area that you may not have considered is that the linings of your blood vessels can be infected. And the best ways to treat that would be, of course, with treatments that are effective, but delivering oxygen to those areas is, and our body uses oxygen to treat infections. It's part of the body's defense using oxygen, oxidizing agents. It uses many different oxidizing agents. So again, cholesterol, <laughs> what we were told is you eat a high fat diet and you get high cholesterol and you get hardening of the arteries. No, if you eat a lot of carbohydrates, Right? And so what happened, everyone went on a low fat diet and we went on a high carbohydrate, high sugar diet and then obesity and cholesterol and everything got worse. So when you decrease the carbs then and, and those infections are less active, you notice inflammation goes down, you notice cholesterol normalizes, which is really awesome. Okay, so again, treating parasites with oxygen therapies on Rumble, live disease-free channel. Make sure to watch that if you haven't already. Make sure to get that oxidizing agent. Make sure to learn how to use it. So in finishing here, I'm just going to uh, quickly answer a few of your questions here, and then I'm going to finish off with kind of talking about the steps. So if you were to just be really sick and you were going to just start using an oxidizing agent orally, it might be really hard, right? So it's really important to set the stage for success, to naturally promote immune modulation first, to be feeling better, and then we can start to treat those infections in our blood vessels and we'll have, it'll be a much more pleasant experience and we'll have more success and we'll be able to treat more quickly. Hello, Margaret. Hi, Kevin. Yay. Hi, Patty. Uh, you remember watching Dr. Zamboni's videos way back? Yes, me too. And thank goodness I never did that. Uh, procedure. I, to me, putting a stint in my blood veins is not a good idea. What if that, you know, what if things get lodged against it and it, it causes inflammation itself? And honestly, I have never, and I've literally interviewed like probably well over, I've treat, I've worked with a thousand students and I've probably talked to, you know, five times that many people. So I've talked to a lot of people that and this is over many years, that were diagnosed with MS, and a small number of them have done the CCSVI. And there's not a single person that has talked, has told me that, like, man, that changed my life. There was a, a couple that said, I had some slight symptom improvements, but that didn't last long, right? So it's not addressing the cause. I mean, it's interesting that he found the narrowing of the veins, and that's insightful, but the remedy for that was not helpful. Hi, Holly. Do you think MS is Lyme? Would you treat both the same way? That's a really good question. So with multiple sclerosis, I believe that very, very common to have the Lyme infections, maybe always. But in, in my students' case is that there's equally, if not greater, of a problem of bigger parasites. So even in, for myself, being MS-free, once I learned how to treat these parasites, because I've studied under doctors and our students have been accessing the parasite treatments, and, and I live in Canada, so I've never been able to treat the parasites properly because we don't have parasites in Canada and our doctors won't help us. So I learned how to treat, and I can tell you personally that the greatest symptom improvement came when I passed the really big worms. I could have been passing like Borrelia can be in your intestines and I could have also been passing Borrelia. I could have been passing fungus. I could have been passing Babesia. I know I've had a history of Babesia also. So yes, the Lyme infections are common, but we also have students that have Lyme disease and have never been diagnosed with MS. And what we they have found is that working with Lyme litter doctors, focusing on treating Lyme, especially with antibiotics, that it just has not been successful for them. What has been successful is backing up, treating the bigger parasites first, and then it's easier to treat the Lyme if you even need to treat it because very often there is some overlap with different remedies that can help to treat fungus, Lyme, bacteria, etc. So we, with the Live Disease Free Plan, Holly, what we do is number one, we follow the Live Disease Free Diet. I've got on our website, livediseasefree.com, you can find the guidelines. Um, there's a cheat sheet. 
We have a live disease-free community on Facebook. Start to implement the diet, get the carbs low. You will notice within seven to 10 days, if your carbs are low enough, significant symptom improvements, like significant. And that'll be, that'll make you excited. It's like, whoa, I'm on the right track. And then make sure to learn about these infections. If this is the first time you've met me, I've got a lot of videos on YouTube and on Facebook and on our website, Live Disease Free, sharing about the different types of parasites that are making us sick. So Dr. Alan McDonald found filarial worms, very small roundworms in the central nervous system of every MS patient that he looked at. And then he also found developing tapeworms. In our students, they have a lot of roundworms, really anywhere from you know six inches, sometimes maybe they're broken, but over over 20 some inches long, very common. I have passed over 20 inch roundworms and flukes, that's another one, flatworms. So they're an equally important, if not bigger important, because they're infecting us with the smaller. So the filarial worms will infect us with Borrelia and possibly others and maybe even Babesia. So I know Dr. Alan McDonald just looked at Borrelia and he found that they were the small, the nematodes in the central nervous system, those roundworms, they were loaded with Borrelia. So it's not just from mosquito bites, it's not just from tick bites, but also from these worms. They are infecting us with their parasites. So what we do in the live disease free plan is number one stop feeding the infections through the live disease free diet they'll still live but you're just not making it a wonderful environment for them you're decreasing the food you'll notice a lot of immune modulation number two support the body making sure we're having daily bowel movements we're sleeping at least eight hours per night we are really looking at our physiology our blood work and making sure that we have that we're supporting the areas that need support so we are feeling a lot better before we start treating. And then when we treat, we get energy tested to see which of the treatments test the best for us, and then we use them. And we use a combination of the oxidative therapy, so the one that I can't share here, make sure to watch that later on Rumble. And also, I mean, if you wanna use ozone, it's great, but it's, it, I believe the other one is more helpful because you can, you can treat every hour for a good part of the day. If you wake up in the middle of the night, you could be taking a swig. So you can treat with oxygen and it's just so cost, it's so convenient and cost effective. So we're using parasite drugs, oxidizing agents, and we're using the uh, parasite herbs. A combination of all three together and a successful prep phase, that's where we did the diet and supporting the body, equals amazing, a life-changing transformation. And I next week, I'm going to be doing my live masterclass, which I only do like a couple of times a year, maybe three times a year. So make sure that you are connected with us and I will be live and I'm gonna be going into the steps of the Live Disease Free Plan in a lot more detail. I'll be showing case studies. You'll be seeing pictures, a lot of pictures of the worms. But again, Molly, the, the holly, the important thing is to make sure that you are first treating the larger parasites before you treat the Lyme or you'll never clear the Lyme. And you probably do have the Lyme infections if you have multiple sclerosis. It's more common than not. Uh, this is great. Yes, oxygen therapy. So the nice thing is, is that the oxygen therapies, they it's kind of like we need a layering of treatments because the parasite drugs on their own are not strong enough. The, the oxygen therapies on their own are not strong enough. But in combination, and the right combination to make sure that we're not doing too much where we feel lousy, that's really where the magic comes. And again, the herbs too, the antimicrobial herbs. So Anthony, your wife does not support this approach as I have an excellent lab in Arizona to see if I am infected with parasites, what do I do? My heart goes out to you, Anthony. Um, all I can share is that this is where, for example, I, I can just think of one wellness champion that I worked with for years, and his name is Troy. And he has had MS since he was 17 years old. His wife works with one of the major pharmaceutical companies, and his mom, so his mom, his wife, his brothers, sisters-in-laws, they all believed that the MS drugs were the answer for him, but he knew in his heart, he'd been on them and he'd had MS for so long, he knew that he was gonna lose his, all of his quality of life and his health if he carried down that, down that path. So even though his family loved him tremendously, they want what's best for him, 
he did this on his own. And he said, honey, I have to do this. I have to do this for me. I have to do this for my family. And so you just have to understand that the parasites are not going to be coming, showing up in those lab tests. I wish they would, but they're not. They're very, we've even, with we have this one gentleman, he is a retired parasitologist. So he's done this all his career. He is retired. So he has time to look for parasites. So one of our students, really, really sick with multiple sclerosis, sent a stool sample down to him. And he examined it and he said, nope, you're clear. The day she got the results from that, from her stool test results that she sent to him, and it was clear, she passed a really big whipworm. And that was from using an oxygen therapy. It hit the worm and it was big. So she literally sent that worm back to that parasitologist and goes, oh yeah, that's a whipworm. So even the best uh, doctors that are parasitologists, it's really hard to identify them because if the worm isn't present there, if they don't see the eggs, they're not going to catch it. And how are they going to exam how are they going to pick up the parasites in our central nervous system or in our blood, right? They're only picking up what is passed through the stool at that moment in time. And the testing is very, very poor. So we don't recommend stool tests because it's a waste of money. You can do a comprehensive stool test. You can do a DNA test for Lyme. You can spend 500 to 1000 or $1,500. Some students have spent upwards of $10,000 just on testing, on various tests. And I have yet to see any really meaningful information. Save your money. If you have a lot of symptoms of fungus, you treat the fungus. If you have a lot of symptoms of Lyme, you're probably going to treat the Lyme too. The nice thing is when you're using the herbs that treat Lyme, there will be some benefit. Like we've had students using the herbs treating Lyme and they've passed big worms with that. And also it'll definitely knock back other bad pathogenic bacteria. So we like liposomal herbs for treating Lyme, but we don't start treating Lyme first. So Anthony, my, um, my encouragement to you would be to follow your heart, to just have a heart to heart talk and say, I don't know anything about you, Anthony, but maybe it's like, you know, honey, I have been sick for all these years and I've done this. I followed this path and look where I'm at right now. I'm ready for a different approach. I have hope. I really, this is scientifically based what I'd like to follow. It's the new, it's, it's what's happening. It's, there's a lot of people that have recovered. You know, I'd like to share the research with you if you, if you're not interested, but this is, you know, like if we love each other, we have to give each other that space, right. To be able to do that. And it's, it's not going to be an inconvenience for her. The diet is really easy. It's not any weird, expensive, difficult diets. It's like, can you eat salads? Can you have steamed vegetables? Can you have, you know, chicken in the oven, a roast beef, uh, hamburgers on the, you just keep the sauce off yours and just have yours with just the herbs and spices. You just don't eat the potatoes. You don't eat the corn. You don't eat all the starchy vegetables, but she doesn't have to cook extra meals. It's not going to interfere with her her schedule, et cetera. So I would just encourage you to follow your heart. If you really believe that this is your answer, then, and also if you have a faith in God, just ask God for help. And sometimes he can really help to open doors and change hearts for sure. Hi, Kevin. Yes, rumble channel is all one word, rumble. Oh, maybe it is all one, I don't know. But rumble is definitely, if you just do a Google search for rumble, you'll find it. And, and I will be moving more and more to there. It's just people don't know to find me there. How do you get someone to join to get rid of the infection? So you want your granddaughter to join the Live Disease-Free program. Deborah. so all you do is that when I'm done, I will post the link to my free training with this video. And I would like you, and I don't know how old your granddaughter is, um, if she's you know, even if she's 16 or in her teens, get her to watch it. It's going to give her a lot of hope and just make sure that she's, she's on board with it because we can't force family members to do this, even if we know this is what they should do and it's the right thing for them. So what you should do is just let her watch the masterclass training with you. Uh, you can also let her join next week. I'll be doing it live, but if you don't want to wait that long, you can watch the replay of my masterclass training. Make sure if you can join next week live because you can ask questions again, especially when I go into great detail, you'll have a lot better questions for me. 
But once you watch that masterclass training, you'll be able to fill out a form, book a time in my calendar, and you'll be able to get all your questions answered. And you'll know all about the, like the program that we have, the cost, what it's involved, how to find practitioners, how to treat, all of that will be ex explained in there in great detail. And you can join. Um, and I always do a welcome call with all of my new students. It's very important for me. Hi, Donna. Have you found that skin issues are also related to parasites? Absolutely. Just think parasites. It, it, like again, it could be bacteria, it can be fungi, it can be protists, it can be worms, different types of microbes. Absolutely. We can have toxins, right? Disease is caused by nutritional deficiencies and different toxins and infections, but most of the toxins come from the infections for sure. What oxidizing agent do you recommend? I can't say the name of it here or this, this video will be taken down and my whole channel might be taken down. That's how crazy it is. So Rumble, the last video, oxygen therapies uh, used to treat, uh, treating parasites with oxygen therapies. If you watch that video, uh, you'll hear all about the different oxidizing agents and kind of towards the end of it, at least two thirds of the way through, that's where I talk about the other the oxidizing agent that is the most helpful. All right, and so make sure to join when I do live Zoom calls. That means that the material is very helpful for you and it's very sensitive and I can't talk about it here. So make sure, maybe someday I'll figure out how to do the live streaming on Zoom also. Melissa, if anyone can afford ozone machine, is it worth buying um, so I can do it at home? I personally wouldn't. I do have an ozone generator. I bought a used one. This was before we learned about that other oxidizing agent. So an ozone generator, if you buy it at, for home use, it's back before COVID, it was about $1,000 to buy it new, but you have to buy and get an oxygen tank you have to get a regulator, you have to get all the hoses and tubes. So it's at least a $2,000 investment. And then you can do rectal encephalation where you're doing ozone. You can do it daily. You can also, um, you can't breathe ozone in, but you can do it in your ears. Um, a person could, if you really know what you're doing, you can bubble ozone through oil and that's the only way you can inhale it, but don't do that. You'd work with a practitioner on that. But the oxidizing therapy that I talk about is like $50. It's so easy, so flexible. You can use it orally. You can be introducing oxygen every hour, like eight to 10 times throughout the day. You don't have to go to a clinic to get ozone treatments. It's just so cheap. It's so easy. And then with enemas, when you're doing the rectal encephalation with ozone, you're only putting ozone for a few seconds into your, um, and you have to work with a doctor. You have to get somebody to teach you how to do it properly, but you're only doing it for like 30 to 45 seconds. But with the other oxidizing agent that you add to water, you're able to work up to larger enemas and you can use gravity to pull this oxidizing water through the entire large intestine. So your intestines, the large are like an upside down U. So it will come up on your left hand side with your bum in the air. The water will trickle up towards your rib cage. You can lay on your right hand side. The water will run across the, across the large intestines and then it'll trickle down to the bottom right hand corner. And that's where a lot of the parasites for me would hide. So this is where you can practice. And with ozone, it's really, you'd have to literally blow your intestines up with ozone gas, like build it up significantly. And I don't know how safe that is. So this is just really easy to do. Um, I mean, if you are really disabled, then it is hard to do enemas. There is something called a Colima board that you can use. You can buy it. It's just a plastic board. You put one end over your toilet, the other end over a chair, and you can lay on it and you can do a high enema. There are people that have, that go to these colonic places and they will add, like they're not allowed to add this oxidizing agent, but they'll let you add it to the water. So you, there's different ways to go about it. And as you feel better and better, you can start to do enemas, but just incredible. Those enemas, like, like when those parasites come out and you see that, you're just like, 
And then you feel better. And then you can tolerate different foods again. Like once you recover well enough, you can bring in more fruit again. You can bring in a few. You're not going to go back to a really high processed carbohydrate diet because that was part of what brought you to this place. But you can have quinoa. You can have brown rice. You can, But you first want to treat well enough, right? So for me, I waited for a long period of time, like months if not years. But I didn't know what we know now. All right, so I'm so happy, Deborah, that gives you that information. I personally wouldn't buy an ozone machine. If you have disposable income, you could go to, um, you know, you can go to a clinic. If you, let's put it this way, if you had cancer, for example, there might be a benefit of, you know, treating the parasites with, again, cancer is also a, an infectious disease. So you, you wouldn't just use ozone. You would probably use, not probably, you would use the parasite drugs that test well for you. You can use ozone. You can use this other oxidizing agent. You want to hit it harder than less hard. You want to be effective. You can't pussyfoot around with something like cancer or even things like ALS or PLS, to diseases that progress more quickly. All right, a couple more questions here. Kathy, what about using uh, this drug for MS? It's not a cure for MS. There is no one parasite drug that will cure MS at this point. We're seeing which are the more common parasites in MS. So the one you mentioned, I can't even say the name of it, but and I'll probably have to delete it because we're not allowed to talk about that on here. But basically there are, I've shared, so our students, they're getting energy tested for multiple parasite drugs. So albendazole, ivermectin, alinea, which is nitazoxanide, praziquantel, parental palmoate, and others. So you, you, it really depends, um, Kathy, what infections you have. So if like, that one you're mentioning, it might be helpful, but it might not be. And so that's why we do, the way that we figure out our plan is through number one, our symptoms, our health history, our diagnosis, and then also which of the treatments we test well for. And they should all kind of make sense together. They should kind of help to build up a confidence that, yes, this, this looks like a really good game plan. But I can tell you that with MS, that roundworms are always present, or like I would, I have not seen a case where there are not roundworms, and they would be big, small, you know, they're present. Some students have flukes. I'm really interested to know how many students have flukes, intestinal flukes in, in uh, particular, and then they have fungus, they have these Lyme infections, right? I did a talk even about malaria, like the Babesia, malaria type protus. So it's, if you just took one parasite drug, which I know some people like to go to these places and they get it, I, I personally wouldn't do that because if you're taking medicines, there's always toxicity. And what if you are making parasites resistant because you're not taking the right dose, you're not Maybe you don't even need it. So why waste your time and money taking something you don't need? And that's what we help you, Kathy, in the Live Disease Free Plan is to get ready to treat, to build a game plan for the specific parasites that you have. And then how to make sure that you're introducing the treatment so that you can continue to live and you're not like laying on the couch feeling like you're just wasted. Could MS come from a uh, specific shot? Yes, um, there definitely are vaccine injuries, Deborah. that can be part of it. But in lesson two in the Live Disease Free Plan, we really look at our health history. And it's usually people that have dysbiosis that have the adverse effects to certain shots, for sure. So not everybody gets the adverse effects to these shots, but some do. And it's usually people that, so with your granddaughter, she was probably out of balance before she had that. And then sometimes that can exacerbate the problems for sure. Are chronic UTIs, parasitic infections, inflammation? Yes, Maureen, they definitely are. Louise, um, the demyelination lesions that show up in MRI brain scans of MS patients, are they caused by parasites? Yes, they are pockets of inflammation, and inflammation is the war zone where your immune system is battling certain types of infections. Absolutely. 
So whenever you think of inflammation in disease, it is caused by infections. My granddaughter is 27 now, so she's open. Awesome. So I would just really send her the link. You And I don't know if she lives with you or lives close to you, but you can watch it together. You can talk about it or just send her the link. You can watch it. She can watch it, discuss it, and then make sure to book a time to chat with me. And when so when you watch the Masterclass training, then you can fill out a form. You'll get an email if we feel that you're ready, if you guys are, if your daughter, if your granddaughter is ready, and which I'm sure she is. And then we will also send you the Coachathon. And the Coachathon is an audio where you really, it's actually video now, because I've been doing it as video, but it goes through the plan in great detail. Because you'll have questions like, how do we get a practitioner? How do we get the treatments? What? How do we know which treatments? So that will answer a lot of questions before we meet so that when we meet, I don't have to explain all of that. Then I can just go more into your granddaughter's health history, what she's done, what she's experienced, and just answer really specific questions that you have remaining. Hi, Joanne. What happens if you treat the worms that you don't have anyway? If you treat for worms and you don't have them anyway? Well, this is why it's not wise to just treat haphazardly, but you know, if you have MS, I would say that you have worms. Like most people that live on planet Earth, we pick them up, right? And it's just like we're supposed to deworm our pets at least twice or three times a year, but then we don't get parasites. <laughs> so yes, we do. Is the diet like keto? Michelle's asking. So the diet is, it's lower carb than paleo, but it's higher carb than keto, and we don't have dairy. That's the big thing. Dairy does not work with different, these parasites. So butter is the only thing. Ghee is better. Butter is tolerated. So we don't have dairy products. And I think the keto is more like 20 total grams of carbs. And we're like more like the 30 to like 35 to 40. And we find that students still have tremendous improvements in their inflammation. So we're really focused on making those infections less active, decreasing inflammation. And the keto diet is helpful for that too, but the dairy is something that should not, we shouldn't have if we have parasites. Um, so any skin disease, Donna, is parasites. I mean, it could be heavy metal detox, but nine out of 10, it would be parasites. Kevin, will you please repeat the name of the Rumble video uh, for oxy treatment. So it is called treating parasites with oxygen therapies, treating parasites with oxygen therapies, and just do live disease free. So our live disease free channel on Rumble, treating parasites with oxygen therapies. So I'll, I talk about the pros and cons of the different therapies. So for example, hydrogen peroxide, Dr. Mercola is wonderful. And I, I share a lot of resources too. So if you end up with a respiratory infection again, and you wanna use uh, nebulizing hydrogen peroxide, there are doctors that give really great instructions on how to do that. And also I give you resources on how to use the oxygen therapy. So I would recommend working with us because we make sure that you know how to use everything safely and correctly, but I also give you resources if you are going to go elsewhere. And it's the resource I give you is very credible and safe. All right, Donna, uh, two more questions and then we'll call it quits. So Donna, um, I know a lady who has MS and she has a parrot. So could she have gotten a round of worms from the parrot? I believe you that parrots probably can have worms. I'm sure that they can. Um, but probably, like she probably, I'm guessing, had the MS before the parasite, before the parrots, I'm guessing. So I don't know, but all I know is that for most people that I work with, that there was something, and it's usually the overuse of antibiotics, that's the biggest factor of what really made them susceptible to a parasitic infestation years ago. And over the years, the parasites have kind of got a bigger grip hold population in the body. And over time, then we end up where our immune system can no longer deal with it. And we end up with an autoimmune disease of some kind. And whatever different parasites we have that are located in whatever areas, that's the disease that we have. Some like to live in our central nervous system, some like our reproductive organs, some like our liver, and et cetera. So this is 
the different types of parasites, where they're located, they cause specific symptoms, and then we get a specific disease label. Can my brain come back? Uh, yes, you certainly can. I can't make any promises, but what I've seen is that we've had several students that they were actually seeing specialists because, and they, one of the students, uh, Lisa May, she is a nurse and she was in a brain study because her cognitive function was so impaired. And by treating the parasites totally above normal cognitive function. So yes, there's great hope for, for the brain to heal itself, absolutely. So Paulette, you got tested for parasites and you were told that you don't have any parasites. And um, there are no parasites. I, I, do I, so I believe you do. And yes, I believe that you do too. You're very welcome. I'm gonna let you guys go. We have gone almost an hour. So again, if you're new to all of this, make sure to watch my masterclass training where I talk a lot more in detail about the parasites. I give case studies, the steps that we take. Uh, you're actually going to see a lot of parasite pictures. Also, I have videos on YouTube, on our Live Disease Free YouTube channel. There are playlists, so you can learn about the infections. You can listen to the amazing successes of, this, of our students. So I just interviewed just a few weeks ago one of our students, Melissa. She has been nine years free of multiple sclerosis. I can't believe it's been nine years already. She hasn't seen a neurologist for nine years, and she looks buffed. She literally had to learn how to walk again. She had such a horrible MS attack that at such a young age, and when she found me, she hadn't worked for 10 years. And now she has a health food company. So you're gonna take some Kleenexes and listen to their stories. Um, and then John, I just did his success a little while ago too. 22 years in a wheelchair, and he is pushing, I can't remember, is at least 50 pounds with leg presses. He went surfing. He's still not walking yet. He's just started treating, but he had so many improvements. He was, he had terrible tremors. He had his wife cut his food. He couldn't hold a glass because the tremors were so bad. And all, he had so many symptom improvements just with the diet and supporting the body. And now he's starting to treat. And because he can do leg presses and because he can walk like he can move his legs, I believe that he is going to be walking again, um, which is, we've seen that so many times. I can't promise, but I believe in my heart he can because I've seen it so often. So if you do have MS, if you do have a horrible disease where you feel like there's no hope, there is hope for you, but you have to take a different path. You have to treat the cause and the cause are, is a parasitic infestation. So make sure to learn about the infections. Make sure to start to change your diet, start to have symptom improvements. And if you would like success or if you would like support and you would like a proven plan, then make sure to watch my masterclass training so that you can actually see what we do to recover. So with that, again, next week I will be live. I won't be on YouTube and Facebook, I will be doing that live masterclass training. Look for the details on Live Disease Free, Facebook, YouTube, Rumble, etc. We will be sharing the details. If you go to our website and you opt in, you'll be on our list and you will get our newsletter, which we send out every uh, Friday, Thursday, Friday, and you, you won't miss any of this research that I share. Have a wonderful week and we will talk to you soon. Take care. Bye-bye for now.